you're finding with these accounts in four countries with two different names, one showing vulnerability, one just the name. You found self-harm content within 2.6 minutes, then eight minutes for eating disorder. What else did you find? What we looked at next was so that that piece of analysis is, I guess, what you'd call qualitative analysis. So it's taking a relatively small sample size and then saying, well, w- what sort of content are we seeing? And we recorded all of this content, by the way. So the, we recorded the first half hour of what's called the For You page. And then a researcher went through and, and categorized what's each video categorized. Is it harmful? What sort of harm? But then we looked specifically at eating disorder content. We found a series of hashtags that linked together the eating disorder content. Some of them had, you know, really obvious hashtags like pro anorexia. Some of them had slightly coded things. So they often had the, the letters ED, eating disorder. But one was like hashtag ED without the Sheeran. So it's referencing the popular singer Ed Sheeran. Um, what we found, what we, what we then did was look at the videos that were on those hashtags and see how many views in total they had. Dr. Phil, it was 13.2 billion. More views than there are people on earth, twice as many as there are people on earth. And that's what was so extraordinary to us. It means the reach of these videos, that's they stunning. are being seen so many times. And how many times do you know, have you had a conversation with your kid about eating disorders? trying to provide them with information about positive body image in the last, say, week. Because I'm telling you, TikTok is outgunning you right now by feeding them eating pro-eating disorder, pro-self-harm content. It is, a, it is an overwhelming wave of malignant content being shoved into our kids' eyes. Yeah, and the answer for a lot of parents, and it would have been for me at that age, is none. I had no conversations about it, and then here they are, getting bombarded with hundreds and hundreds of videos and they're produced and they're dramatic and there's music and they're intoxicating. And we we know that it's not just young girls, by the way, it's young boys who are receiving this content. They're receiving content about body, about, about their body images, about what's called bigorexia. So increasingly there's a lot of content to young boys encouraging steroid use, encouraging you know, dangerous bodybuilding techniques that are really bad for a growing body in which you haven't developed your full muscularity, your full bone density, your full physical uh, physical ability. There's also content that's encouraging other types of extremism, stuff that you and I have talked about in the past, things like hatred of women. You know, w- one of our studies showed that if you set up an account as a 13-year-old boy, within seven minutes, you're being fed content by a guy called Andrew Tate, who's an extremist hater of women online. And so you see this kind of this mirror image to the damage that's being to young girls in young boys as well. Yeah. Parents need to maybe look at some of this content because when we're saying hatred of women, I mean, it's very specific. It gets down to grab them by the throat, throw them down, do what you want to do or they don't think you're a man. I mean, it's teaching young boys, this is how you relate to women. This is how you succeed. When we have shown parents what that content is and how they're being taught, this is how to be a man, they stand there just with their mouths open. It's like, are you kidding me? And they had no yeah. idea. Yeah. I, look, I, I, I gave a speech. So uh, I got called by a head teacher recently in a school who said to me that his 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 class that his classes were all obsessed with with this kind of content and he was really scared he wanted me to come and talk to them when when I spoke to those kids it was amazing to see to what extent this next generation has been is being indoctrinated at pace with content that encourages them to believe that a real man hurts women and disrespects them And that is exactly the opposite of the messages that their parents, their schools, everyone else's society is giving them. The problem is that they're seeing these videos 100, 200, 300 times in a few months. And again, this is an inequality of arms. Like this is an asymmetric battle. The other side is winning because they have control of the information ecosystem, of of the platforms that are being used to deliver messages to those young people. And that is really scary because it will have an impact. There's an entire generation that are being taught 
not to love women, not to be able to have strong relationships that are bigger than the sum of the whole, something that you and I both are blessed to have in our lives. They are not being taught that. They are being taught that relationships are a zero-sum game, that someone has to win, someone has to lose, and the way you win is violence. Yeah. And the number of views, the number of young men that are clicking on this and being indoctrinated by it is staggering. Yeah. It's staggering. One of the things that I need to get your take on is when we talk about TikTok and this algorithm, you can't help but get this vision of this dark castle with a bunch of evil people in there wringing their hands in a melodramatic way. And the fact is, that's not the case. If you meet people that work at TikTok, you talk to them, they're moms and dads. If you randomly picked a hundred people out of there, it's almost like they're siloed. These over here in this department don't know everything that's going over in this department. It's not like there is a mission statement that they've all sold their souls to do this. It's almost like the algorithm, the artificial intelligence has been programmed initially and then taken over and gotten sinister on its own. And there are top level people that allow it to continue to drive the content distribution. But my experience of meeting lots and lots of people from these platforms is they can't even explain it. Is it a top-down toxicity? Where is it coming from? I broadly agree with you. And I, I certainly did until a couple of years ago when two things happened. First of all, a whistleblower from Facebook came out who had evidence from their internal network showing that there were thousands of documents available to all staff that showed that they knew the problems. I don't have a, I, I think any business, of course, sometimes things go wrong, right? And sometimes things go wrong in any, in any well-meaning pursuit in life. But my problem is that when you know something's going wrong, and when you fail to do something about it, when people ask you and show you the impact of it, when parents say, to, you know, say, my child is dead because of your algorithm, and then you still continue to deny, deflect, delay, to even worse, throw dollars at it, lobbyists at it, rather than do the right thing, then I think you become morally culpable. And I, I fear we are at that point right now. And it, there is actually, you know, I, I, I think that some of those executives have, have seduced themselves into believing that the legal immunity they have under the current laws, Section 230, as you mentioned, the legal immunity they have from any liability for, that, for other people's content on their websites is also a moral impunity for the consequences of what happens with that content. And they don't. Legal does not necessarily mean w what is true in morality. And they have proven very vulnerable to people like you and people like me who kind of stand up and say, no, you must do better. I, 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 I think we are at a tipping point now where we have to stop giving them the benefit of the doubt. We have to stop being as generous and kind to them as we have been and say, actually, these people, they're kind of not great people themselves. Is it to the point that they're positioning themselves for deniability is like, don't ask, don't tell, don't read those pages yeah. of documents and just do your job and don't look up and pretend you don't know? Because they're reading the same things we're reading. They are. Um, or they can. The, the, look, I, I think it is a little bit of don't see, you know, don't ask, don't tell. And this sort of age of impunity that they've enjoyed is coming to an end, not necessarily in the United States, but certainly around the world. The European Union, for example, has just created a Digital Services Act that will hold them accountable. If they fail to deal with things like this, they could be fined up to 10% of their global revenues. The United Kingdom, I'm really proud to say that I was the first witness to give evidence to Parliament on a new bill, an online safety bill, which, is, which should be law by April of this year. Just yesterday, the British government announced that they will, or, uh, that they will actually introduce criminal sanctions. So if executives 
fail to if you know if if the government identifies a problem uh, like like self harm content, if they fail to do anything about it again and again and again, eventually an executive could end up in jail for it. And I, I think that is because a lot of a lot of legislators are getting frustrated with these platforms failing to take action when they know the problem and they're being begged by people to do something about it. I think part of the thing they hide behind, too, is what I was saying about not overreaching with the lawsuit. For example, eating disorders. We do know that those that obtain with an eating disorder, 70% of them statistically do have trauma in their lives. They do have genetic components. They do have bad role modeling. They do have a variety of things. But if we know that, then so do the platforms. You can't say, well, what's the acceptable casualty rate? It's like if you're putting the content out and you know that 30% of the young women that are going to be reading this, the teens, the preteens, are vulnerable to this or whatever. Is that an acceptable rate? Then the answer is not just no, but hell no. You can't put that out there when you know that a portion of your population, it's not a matter of if, but when they are going to succumb to that. And it's not a matter of it's just there if you search for it. They're force feeding it to them. Yeah, that that that's where it becomes really problematic. And you know, like that court case that um, that Matt has, it's really important that we realise that these companies aren't just a neutral platform on which people just write down what they think and everyone can see what everyone's thinking. These are publishing platforms that choose what content wins and what loses. They're publishing platforms. They're making decisions by algorithms. Those algorithms are written by human beings and they're making decisions as to what the content of the equations, you know, the mathematics that underpins these algorithms are. And they have chosen to prioritize addictiveness and profitability over safety. They aren't conducting risk assessments. They aren't thinking about vulnerability. And if they do think about vulnerability, well, gosh, they're doing an absolutely terrible job. They're pretty incompetent to run platforms that have such impact, aren't they? Well, I would think so. And I don't want to play boy lawyer here, but I do want to explain this so people that maybe are falling victim to this right now understand. You define negligence as saying failing to do what a reasonable person would do under the same or similar circumstances, but then gross negligence is when you show such a complete and utter disregard for the impact of what you're doing as to rise to the level of intentionality. You show such a complete disregard for the impact of what you're doing, that it's as though you could predict it. It was foreseeable. It's the same as if you did it on purpose. So even if you just say they didn't mean to, if you have such a disregard for the impact of what you're putting on your platform, what your algorithm is doing, that, at least in American jurisprudence, is the same as if you woke up and said, I'm going after these vulnerable teens and I'm going to target them with this and cause them to have this problem. 